Finally, the video is here. We'll provide a step-by-step -step guide on launching a 20-ton fighter jet from a 100-meter runway. Let's see how the United States Navy has made this process a choreography among hundreds of people. Because where you see a plane rolling on deck, there are actually dozens of people involved to get that plane to take off in a matter of minutes. The most incredible thing is that I was able to witness this process firsthand when NATO invited me to the United States ship George Bush. An aircraft carrier's deck is among the most hazardous workplaces. There are planes landing and taking off at 300 kilometers per hour, cables whipping around, engines that can suck you in, propellers at full power just inches from your head, or hot air coming out of the planes which can burn you or throw you. Shot over the side of the ship, about 35 meters high. The first rule is that everyone must watch moving planes and never turn their backs on them, especially those landing and taking off in case action is needed to save lives if something goes wrong. Like, for example, this day when a cable broke and several people were injured. Another person realized the situation and dodged the cables. In addition, it is mandatory to wear a life jacket precisely in case the air from an engine pushes you off deck. Since the fall is several tens of meters, the life jacket automatically inflates upon contact with salt water, in case due to the impact the person has been knocked unconscious. Besides, the life jacket is designed to automatically turn him face up so that person doesn't drown. In addition to this, a helmet with built-in sound protectors is mandatory. Precisely because of the chilling sound on deck, it's impossible to talk and therefore communication must be visual. Although there are like 10% of the people, Operations directors in yellow usually carry microphones and headphones to communicate with each other and with the Airbus in the pre-fly as seen previously. Firstly, when you're on an aircraft carrier or when you watch videos of aircraft carriers, the workers' jackets in different colors catch the eye. This is designed so that the jacket is an indicator of that person's task. Additionally, helmet colors also serve as indicators. That way, if the air boss from the tower wants to keep track of the fuel personnel at a certain time, he knows that he simply has to look for someone in purple. As you can understand, it is tremendously useful to know what each person does just by seeing their jacket and helmet color. The organization of the colors is as follows. White is used for everything related to safety. Personnel responsible for monitoring deck safety, medical staff, and those performing final safety checks. Known as the travel shooters and the LSOs, the landing signal officers, of which we already talked about in the third video of this series. Though well, these aircraft carrier pilots go without helmets, they have the right to do as they please. In fact, many don't even wear earplugs, and look how they were a few years ago. Those in charge of the weaponry, and also the firefighters, in case there is a fire on deck, go in red. Those in charge of fuel, go in purple. Those in charge of tying the planes to the ground with chains, go in blue. Because yes, the planes, whenever they are parked, are tied to the ground. In fact, the deck of an aircraft carrier is full of these hooks. Those in blue also manage the elevators and tractors on deck. The plane captains, who are responsible for taking care of the plane, wear brown. Remember this name well. Each plane captain takes care of a plane as if it were his own. To understand this, there is a joke in the Navy that says that the planes really belong to the plane captains and that the pilots borrow them. For a few hours, they are also in charge of doing the checklist before starting the planes and during the startup, they are the ones who give instructions to the pilot. These are squadron personnel, which means that once the planes from the squadron take off, they leave. No, like everyone else who is on deck with all the planes and does not belong to any particular squadron, they simply give instructions to all the planes that are on deck. In green, we have maintenance personnel, photographers, catapult and cable personnel, and these greens are the color that most people wear on deck. And finally, in yellow. We have the official catapult plane directors, also known as shooters, and in general, the directors of any task. That is, yellow means they are directors of something, and that's why these are the ones who usually have the communications. Do you remember from the fourth video of this series? We said that the areas of an aircraft carrier are named so that everyone can refer to them quickly. Uh, but also, the elevators are also numbered in such a way that if it is communicated that elevator number two is going up to two. F-18 is everything. Does everyone know which elevator they are referring to? 
Similarly, the catapults are also numbered, and this nomenclature is always the same for all Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. On each catapult, there is a safety line. Everyone who witnesses a launch must be outside of those lines. The experience you get standing right here on this line is going to be amazing. The experience of you putting your foot over that line is not going to be amazing because now you put yourself in danger. So as you're filming, take your step back and film. Now the time has come. Let's see everything that has to happen for this to happen. Let's say an F-18 is parked in the yard and is going to take off from catapult number four. The sequence would be as follows. Firstly, an hour and 45 minutes before the scheduled takeoff time. The pilots brief to discuss the mission and its key points. After this briefing, they would talk to the maintenance staff about the necessary fuel and weaponry. This is essential because it will set a takeoff weight for the plane, and it is necessary to put it in the parameters of the catapult as we will see later. All this information is relayed to flight deck control. The room, already seen, is at deck level where pilots get dressed, ensuring their readiness on deck. 45 minutes before takeoff. Meanwhile, from the flight deck control, the fuel and armament managers are sent to prepare the aircraft. When the pilot returns, the plane captain, the one in brown, has already prepared the plane to be operational. And he has removed the safety pins. In total, there are eight. He must show the pins to the pilot to confirm they have been removed. These pins are physical pins that block various parts of the plane while it is parked, such as the seat of both. Next, after this, the pilot proceeds to do a walk around. This consists of taking a turn around the plane, checking that everything is indeed ready. All accidents always occur due to a chain of failures, and in aeronautics, to prevent an accident from occurring, no one should trust anyone. And that's why the pilot must see with his own eyes that the pins are no longer in the plane. Even if the plane captain is the pilot's best friend, the pilot must see with his own eyes that the pins are no longer in the plane. It's not about the pilot distrusting the plane captain, but about making assumptions. During the thousands of times the plane captain does his job, he might not do it quite right for some reason. And that's when that second check saves lives. For this very reason, the pilot will also do a walk around even though the plane captain did it minutes before. This philosophy is used a lot by the Navy. You're going to see that all procedures are always supervised by more than one person. After completing the walk around, the pilot boards the plane and starts the engines once the airboss gives the go-ahead over the radio. As mentioned, the plane captain gives the pilot the instructions. First, the auxiliary power unit is turned on, pointing with one hand towards the auxiliary power unit air outlet and rotating the fingers of the other hand. Then, they start engine number two. To do this, they point to engine two and shake the opposite hand, indicating the number two in the air. After starting engine number two, they start engine number one. To do this, they point to engine one with one hand and shake the other in the air, indicating a one. After that, the plane captain steps forward and begins a thorough check of the control surfaces, while other observers confirm that everything is working properly. Once the check is completed, the plane captain raises his hands so that the pilot keeps his hands raised. This is because some mechanics are going to approach the aircraft, do another visual check. If the pilot moves the control surfaces abruptly now, could someone get injured? See how quickly these control surfaces move. A blow to the head could be quite serious. After this, a plane director comes and takes control. Until this moment, the pilot was just looking at the plane captain doing what he was indicating. This is fascinating because the pilot can only focus on one person who is said to have control over the aircraft. The procedure to pass control to another person is first to point to yourself, indicating that you have control at that moment, then point to the other operator who will receive control. What he will do is point to himself as a way of reconfirming that he is the one taking control. You will see this happen several times during the launch sequence. Well, once the aircraft director takes control, the first thing is to remove the chains from the plane, which is indicated to the mechanics with this signal. Once the worker in the yellow vest sees the chains off the plane, he signals the pilot so he knows. And that's when the deck taxi procedure begins. Throughout the aircraft carrier, there are different plane directors, and they pass control of the aircraft from one to another so they don't have to move. In fact, the theory says they should remain still so as not to create a false sense of movement in the pilot who is taxiing. This is especially important at night when you can't see anything at all. Once the plane taxis and gets to just a few meters before the catapult, the plane director who has led it there will give it three signals. 
They don't always have to be in this order, but they are to stop, lower the catapult hook, and extend the wings, which until that moment could be folded. Let's take a pause in time, because after that, a lot of things happen simultaneously. At this moment, two green shirts, the hook bar operator and a catapult operator, approach Morrow's train. The first one is the one who has the bar that holds the plane in position before the launch. We explained this system in detail in the second video of the list. In summary, when a plane is about to be catapulted, it puts the engine power to the maximum, and it doesn't move forward because it's this hook that holds the plane. But when the catapult is activated, the hook can't handle so much force and releases the aircraft. Well, this hook is put by the hook bar operator, but it is always checked by a catapult operator who is right behind the first one and checks that it has been put correctly. The philosophy is to not trust just one person. Once he checks that the bar is well placed, he stays next to the nose gear. While giving instructions to the plane director for the plane to continue forward until it reaches the catapult's tooth, but without surpassing it. Like the pilot, he only focuses on the plane director, who currently controls the plane. And also, he really doesn't have visual contact with the green shirt right below him. The procedure is for the green one to signal the yellow plane director, and he signals the pilot. Also at this moment, an operator approaches with a board on which he puts the weight of the plane. Based on his experience, will the pilot signal to correct if that weight is not accurate? This value is then shown to the catapult operator who prepares the power of the catapult based on the plane model, weight, and weather conditions. Also at this time, the jet blast deflectors are raised, which are surfaces that redirect the air coming out of the engines upwards. Operations can continue on the deck, even behind a fighter jet with engines at maximum power. These surfaces are made up of ceramics that insulate the temperature very well and are also cooled by salt water. Allowing a fighter jet to have the afterburner active, giving these deflectors a couple of minutes and the materials do not melt. The lifting of the GBDs is done under the supervision of a person in a green shirt who gives instructions to the person responsible for lifting them who is on the side. The sequence resumes at this point as the previous events occurred simultaneously. As the plane inches forward, guided by the catapult operator's signals, the shovel shooters conduct a final inspection on critical components of the aircraft. Meanwhile, others in red shirts do the same, but with weapons. The plane reached the catapult tooth but failed to hook it. What about the catapult operator on the train? Moro runs to the side, briefly taking control, a red shirt. This is because they electronically arm the plane, a step only carried out if the aircraft is armed. Until now, the weapons were deactivated. In other words, even though the missiles are placed on the wings, if the pilot fires them at this moment, they will not activate. This last step is required for that. If you think about it, it makes sense that it's almost at the moment of launch, because the plane isn't going to be strolling around the aircraft carrier with missiles that could accidentally activate. Before taking control, the red-shirted operator ensures no one is in front of the aircraft. After confirming the area is clear, red-shirted operators approach the plane's nose to activate a switch and the wings to remove pins from the missiles. From this moment on, the plane is indeed electronically armed. After this, control is immediately returned to the aircraft director. At this point, the catapult operator runs back to the Morrow train and proceeds to tension the plane. This means that the pilot is given instructions to move forward a few more inches and once the hook surpasses the tooth. The green operator checks that everything is okay and proceeds to make the gesture of extending the arm, which indicates that the plane can be tensioned. This means that the catapult will be slightly activated. The catapult is currently applying forward force and the bar is what's keeping the plane stationary. The catapult operator checks that everything is okay, hooked up, and then runs off. At this point, the aircraft director hands over control to the catapult director, also known as the shooter, and this is the one who will finally give the signal for the plane's launch. The first action he takes upon assuming control is signaling the pilot to maximize the power using a specific gesture. Meanwhile, the pilot does the last check of the control surfaces. Right now, the troubleshooters are kneeling beside the plane, ensuring all components are functioning properly. If all looks normal, they give a thumbs up and everyone nearby follows suit. After checking the control surfaces, the pilot greets the shooter, confirming the cockpit is ready for launch. The shooter returns the greeting and keeps his hand up, so the pilot takes his hands off the controls. This is so he doesn't touch anything until the plane is in the air. The plane will automatically make the nose-up gesture as it leaves the catapult. 
Over the years, it has been observed that pilots should refrain from any actions until airborne. The shooter checks all the positions around one by one, making sure everyone has their thumbs up and that there is no one in the middle of the track. If all is well, he crouches, touches the track, and points ahead. That's when the person in charge of launching the plane does a final check and presses the button. And this is when that feeling comes that I will never ever forget. The plane accelerating forward, feeling a rumble in the chest. Friends, those are the engine's shockwaves passing through your body. The most amazing thing of all is that you're recovering from that extreme rumbling sensation in your chest. And before you know it, there's another plane ready to take off. This is literally non-stop because we've seen the procedure following a plane. But if you stay still in one position, you see one plane after another pass by. Some shooters put more effort into launching planes than others. But I am clear about who it would be. For example, watch these videos of the catapult directors dancing. Now you can grasp their actions. What he has done here is to signal himself to take control and indicate to the pilot to start giving power. In this image, the aircraft director who brought the plane to the catapult transfers control to the catapult director. These last videos are for laughs, but the process is tremendously studied so that even if someone does something wrong, a catastrophe does not occur. Because the Navy assumes that at some point, after several hours of work in the sun, with 120 decibels in the background and breathing kerosene, someone will mess up. Hence the process is so refined and there is not a single step that depends exclusively on one person. If anyone sees anything odd, they should make a cross with their hands, and everyone who sees it should do the same. In this way, as before launching the plane, everyone is looked at one by one, the launch would never be authorized. And in case it's the pilot who inside the cockpit has seen something he didn't like, he would shake his head non-stop and contact the airboss by radio so that he can cancel the catapult from above. From now on, you'll grasp all aircraft carrier videos. Subscribe if you're new to catch the upcoming craziness. It would greatly help if this video was widely distributed to increase awareness of the aircraft carrier video series I'm creating. All sources used for this video are in the description. Many thanks to NATO for the invite to the United States ship George Bush.